ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. OK, everybody, here we go. Forward. It's 2019, Boris Johnson has become Prime Minister and the Boris train is off. We are going to energise the country. We're going to get Brexit done on October the 31st. We're going to take advantage of all the opportunities that it will bring in a new spirit of can-do. But just over two years and a global pandemic later, the PM finds himself going in the wrong direction. Boris, you're going the wrong way. This way. Boris, this way. Leaked photos of gatherings and parties at number 10 showed him and other officials apparently breaking COVID guidelines on social distancing. In January 2022, Londoners gave their verdict on the then Prime Minister's role in the Partygate scandal. I think he's, he's a lying, conniving piece of work who needs to resign immediately. I think it's an absolute disgrace. Then, in July last year, Boris resigned as PM, despite surviving a no-confidence vote just a month earlier. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. Fast forward to today, Mr Johnson's faced a three-hour grilling by the Privileges Committee over whether he misled Parliament when he told MPs that Covid lockdown guidance was followed during parties and social gatherings in Number 10 and Whitehall during the pandemic. There's nothing I can see, and I've got to tell you this, there's nothing I can see in that uh, photograph that strikes me as being either against the rules or the guidance. Tory peer Lord Robert Hayward has warned if Boris is found to have misled Parliament, it could trigger a by-election in his constituency, which he predicts the former PM would lose. So, what comes next for Boris Johnson? And is the Boris train heading for an abrupt stop? Joining me now is Dr Catherine Haddon, a senior fellow from the Institute for Government. So first of all, Catherine, can you just talk us through really the background to this saga and some of the key points the Privilege Committee meeting was focused on? So for a lot of people, this will seem like another rehashing of Partygate. What happened? Was it wrong? Are there mitigating circumstances and so forth? But this committee hearing was primarily supposed to be about Boris Johnson's responses to Parliament when the Partygate allegations first were raised in November 2021, so quite some time ago now, and whether or not the way he responded to questions misled Parliament, and he's he's admitted now that it, it did, but he says inadvertently. So the question has become, did he do so on purpose? Did he do so recklessly? And that's what the committee were talking to him yesterday about. They have already spent quite a bit of time collecting evidence, re-going over all of the evidence that Sue Gray collected, not relying on it on its own merits, but actually going back to witnesses and asking if they still stand by what they said, going back over all the WhatsApps from the period and so forth. And it is looking in particular at whether or not Boris Johnson's first responses when he said no rules and guidance were broken or that they were followed completely, that whether or not he had justification for doing that, given what is now known about what had happened, his presence at various gatherings, and also what is known about his knowledge of the guidance at the time. So was that a reasonable response? And then when he changed his response and talked about having repeated assurances that rules were not broken, uh, why he said that and whether or not that was an adequate response. And we've seen a lot of clips circulating on social media this morning from the three hour grilling yesterday. What did you make of how the Privileges Committee meeting went yesterday for Boris Johnson? I mean, it was quite an extraordinary moment of of parliamentary theatre. I think the, the first thing to say is that a lot of select committee meetings become very discursive. And one of the things that that MPs are criticised for uh, is the style of questioning that they used. And yesterday you saw them uh, approaching a much more 
legalistic style of questioning, much more what you might see in a courtroom. So lots of closed questions where Boris Johnson was sort of told a factual piece of information and said, is this true? Yes or no. Actually, the thing, though, did descend into quite a rolling conversation, not least because Boris Johnson would often interrupt the the questions. So it, it became a little bit more chaotic. And at times it became quite heated. And I think people watching would say that on the one hand, Boris Johnson did seem very well prepared. He had lawyers surrounding him to the left and sitting in a row behind him who were able to pass notes but weren't able to speak on his behalf. And he was clearly across the detail as he understood it. But there were times when his exchanges with the committee became a little bit more heated. You know, he talked about sort of used the word ridiculous to one of the things that they were talking about. There was quite a heated exchange at the end about Boris Johnson's view of the fairness of the proceedings and and also a discussion about what had been briefed by some of his supporters about the, the committee and calling it a kangaroo court. So, yeah, it was a bit more of, of both something very different from, from what we see normally in Parliament and also falling into what we are used to, which is parliamentarians becoming quite heated when, when these things are quite political and getting into quite controversial areas. Can you see a situation where people's opinions will change based on what they saw yesterday or, or read about the actual meeting itself? It, it sort of feels unlikely that people are going to be changing their views as a result of it. I mean, it's difficult to say. There's been a bit of polling this morning which suggests that it hasn't really moved the dial on uh, people's views of Boris Johnson and whether he lied to Parliament. Um, uh, looking at Twitter yesterday, it was just reinforcing people's uh, existing uh, opinions, whether they are admonishing Boris Johnson or whether they are uh, supporting his position. So I'm not really sure whether it provided us with any more light about what went on. There's been a few new pieces of information, but that's more over the course of the last week as we had both a statement from the committee and one from Boris Johnson and a bundle of evidence, so lots of WhatsApps and other witness statements. And those have given us a little bit more detail. But as Johnson himself pointed out, nothing that is definitive one way or another. So it is really going to come down to a judgment call first by that committee and then by the MPs who are watching it. I'm not sure it will have changed public opinion very much about this. And for the Conservative Party, that in itself is a problem because all it's doing is bringing back up another issue that uh, the Conservatives would like to move on from. Let's take a break now. In part two, Dr Haddon gives her take on whether Boris Johnson's political career would be over if he was to lose a by-election. If you're talking about Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister again, it's hard at the moment to see the route to that, but you could never count him out. You sort of touched on this at the start, but have you been surprised at how long this Partygate scandal saga has lasted and just how much investigation has actually gone into it? In one sense, no, because the original Sue Gray investigation obviously went on for months and months. And then we had the Met Police investigation, which then went on for some more months and weeks. And then Sue Gray finally reported. And and it was only then that we could move into this process. So and also knowing Parliament and, and select committees, these are MPs who are doing other jobs as well. This isn't a court of law for many reasons, but also because it's not the only thing that they're doing. And they have been dealing with a huge amount of of evidence. So I can understand a certain amount of frustration for many people, you know, those involved, Boris Johnson and his team, possibly members of the public and and also some of us watching that, you know, we would like to move on from this and, and draw a line under it. But on the other hand, Given the nature of what they're looking at, and if you step back from it, you know, quite a fundamental point about whether or not a former prime minister, when he was then prime minister, misled parliament is quite a big issue. So parliament does need to make sure that it it feels like it's doing that properly. And and it is quite a small committee. So to some extent, I'm not surprised that it has taken as long as it has. One of the big talking points today following the meeting yesterday is the suggestion that Boris could face a suspension and if he is found to have misled Parliament, also suggestions that could trigger a by-election in his constituency. Can you just talk us through how those things could actually unfold, if that's the case? So what the... 
Privileges Committee do is they make their own judgment about whether or not a contempt has been committed. And a contempt can be whatever Parliament defines as a contempt. But in this case, it's about whether or not Parliament was obstructed or impeded from doing its job by him deliberately or recklessly misleading them. So they make a judgment about that. They then decide on what they think the sanction should be and they will look at precedents of what the Privileges Committee and its twin, the Standards Committee, have come up with in terms of equivalent sanctions for other things, that, uh, other contempts or, or other misbehaviour by MPs. But then they recommend that to MPs as a whole. So the entire House of Commons will get to vote. In short, what we could see is either there is something under 10 days suspension from the House, which it's not a rap on the knuckles, but it is a lesser a sanction for, for Boris Johnson. Other people have been suspended from the House for a few days for things like even speaking out of turn in the chamber when the, the Speaker has told them to withdraw a comment. If it's more than 10 days, what it risks triggering is a recall petition. So that's uh, Boris Johnson's own constituents deciding that they want a by-election. And then if there is a by-election, Boris Johnson has to fight to keep his seat. And that's, you know, the thing that is at risk that I think is in the minds of, of all MPs, not just Boris Johnson. And if the worst was to happen for Boris Johnson and he was to lose his seat, do you see that as the end of his political career? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, everyone talks about, you know, the possibility of a Boris Johnson comeback. What could that look like? On the other hand, the party, his own party does seem to have moved away from him now. And it it was notable that yesterday another vote in the House uh, about the Windsor framework didn't have the scale of rebellion that some were predicting, even though Boris Johnson was one of the people that opposed Rishi Sunak's measures on Northern Ireland. So, you know, it's hard to see if you're talking about Boris Johnson becoming prime minister again, it's hard at the moment to see the route to that, but you could never count him out. I think that the interesting thing for me about um, Boris Johnson facing a by-election is when he was uh, facing being removed from office as prime minister, one of the things that he and others were talking about was his own personal mandate. And they were talking about the 2019 general election. But actually in our system, the only people that voted for Boris Johnson were his constituents. So if he's talking about, you know, he's a popular guy with a a personal mandate, then it is from those constituents. So it would be an entirely democratic process if it was a by-election that then removed him as an MP or indeed returned him as an MP despite all of this. There's more news, interviews and analysis in the Evening Standard newspaper and at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock.